Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Signal or Noise. This is episode 18. Charlie Bellella here, and joining me as always, Peter Malouk. Peter, first topic I want to run into here is talking about cash. This was a big story, obviously, in 2023. You had a huge surge of money going into money market funds, into CDs, and $8.8 trillion by the end of last year in these two vehicles. Why were people going into cash? A lot of reasons. Biggest one, of course, is the fact that cash now has a pretty good yield, 5.5% highest since 2000. The other big reason last year was all of the fears heading into the year, obviously, fears of recession, what happened in 2022, inflation, and anything else you can think of. Obviously, for the year, the ironic thing is none of those panned out. Stock market actually did, obviously, much better than cash. What are your thoughts overall on cash and how are you thinking about this as an allocation for people? And what should people be thinking about today when it comes to cash? Well, I mean, people had cash um, for a decade because it, it didn't have cash for a decade because it paid zero. It just literally paid nothing. So if someone was sitting on cash, they're really just subsidizing their banks. And so you saw the yield go up, as you noted. I think you had a combination of everyone being super negative about the markets and the markets did not do well for 10 of the 12 months of the year. So you have markets with a bad outlook and doing poorly and cash paying a lot. People left, you know, piled up their money in the banks. Well, it turns out market rally, all the markets rallied year end. Didn't matter where you were, small, mid, large, US, overseas, you would have been way better off, as usually happens in the markets, uh, than in cash. And especially when you look at the tax rate for cash, which is ordinary income rates versus the market, which is zero until you sell, and then it's capital gains rates, the investor is better off being in stocks or bonds than in cash. My position on cash, even with yields where they are, is you should have enough to get through an emergency. If you lose your job, we need to get you through the next three to six months. That should be in cash. Everything else should be invested. Yep. And I think the hard part for people to kind of reconcile because in the short run it doesn't seem to be costing you very much at all and i was listening to popular investment podcast the other day and they were talking about their recommendations for last year and they were kind of high-fiving each other for saying they should be in cash <laughs> <laughs> i guess without realizing what the markets had done but saying yeah. essentially i don't need to take any risk uh, with cash rates this high but i think that loses the bigger picture right that there is an opportunity cost of cash. And you don't really see it in the short run. It creeps up over time. And what this chart here is really illustrating is, yeah, in any given year, you have about a one in three chance that cash might beat the stock market because you know the stock market might go down in a given year. Uh, and that's about the probabilities there. But if you go out five years, that drops to 22%, 10 years, 16%, 20 years, 1% chance. And that was only during the Great Depression, 25 years goes down to zero. And the numbers really don't add up to anything big until you start moving out again. Over a one-year period, cash gives you about 3% versus the stock market long-term return. We know what that is. But as you go out, it just gets bigger and bigger, this gap. And when you compound that gap, it just gets to be enormous. If you're looking at a 10-year period, 158% underperformance, 20-year period, 705% performance. You're talking about cash. And as you said, when cash was zero, it's taking even longer, obviously, to double your money. But in the stock market, it's about once every seven years on average. You're looking at cash in the last you know, 80 years, the average is it's taking a little about a little over 20 years and if you look at the last 20 years obviously it's taking even longer so i think that's lost on people but what would you say in terms of people saying uh if cash rates are higher then i should i should be holding a bigger percentage in cash because perhaps that gap between cash and the stock market is going to be smaller is that valid at all to you or or would you say you know, throw it out because in the long run, still the stock market's going to be cash. I throw it out, and I think this is an incremental game. Your your charts just your charts illustrate that you know very clearly that you want to you don't want to have cash if you can have bonds. You don't have bonds if you can have stocks. So if you're not at the mercy of the markets, meaning you can let your money have time to grow in the markets for five years, ten years plus, the odds, as you just laid out, slide after slide, are overwhelming. The investor is going to do better in the markets. 
and especially keep more of that money because they're not paying that high tax rate along the way. And in high inflationary periods, they're going to be protected. You're not going to be protected in cash. We just went through a, a great example of that where the cost of everything went up 30 to 50% over the last four years. If you were sitting in cash, you might be proud of yourself. You earned 3 to 5% along the way. You got destroyed. You needed to be in the markets. And so definitely stocks for the long run to protect yourself against inflation and because the odds are overwhelmingly in your favor if you do that. Yeah, so keep enough cash so you can sleep at night and you never have to touch the longer term investments in your portfolio. And all of this analysis that I'm showing here and these numbers, the, the, num the differential is enormous as it is. But as we know, most people aren't getting this highest yield on cash. They're not going out and buying three month treasury bills. A big portion is just sitting in a checking account still earning nothing. So the gap is even wider because there's inertia, right? Most people were so used to cash earning nothing that when it changed so quickly over the past few years, they're still stuck in that old regime. And perhaps now, as we'll talk about in a little bit, that cash rate is going to start going down again, which is the other problem with cash. You don't, you're not guaranteed that 5% return forever. All right, I want to switch gears here and talk about the Fed and talk about uh, first the market's expectations and what the Fed is projecting here. So I'll lay that out here. We have the Fed funds rate 525 to 550. So if we look at the spread between that and what the Fed's core inflation rate is, their, their, their core PC is their preferred measure of inflation. So we have a 2% gap between the Fed funds rate and that core inflation rate. That's the biggest spread. So the tightest monetary policy we've seen since 2007. And what people are saying now is this is going to not last very much longer. For a period last year, we, were, we talked about there was a sense, okay, the Fed is going to stay higher for longer. And then by the end of the year, that really shifted very rapidly. We got better inflation data. And then we got that Fed meeting in December where they said, we're going to cut rates in terms of their projections three times next year. Now, they could change their projections, obviously. But the fascinating thing, Peter, is that the market is saying, we'll see those three rate cuts in 2024. And we're, we're thinking we're going to give you three more. So what the market's actually saying is the Fed is going to cut rates six times in 2024 and end the year with the Fed funds rate down at 3.9%. So let's first ad answer the question, is this too early? Should the Fed be cutting rates in March? And then we can talk about some of the other things around that. I think I think everyone would be surprised if they cut rates in March. Um, but I do think that what's what's the market's telling us is they're expe we're expecting weakness, right? That the economy is worse than it appears. It's driven by debt. Uh, we don't see the growth that we that we really um, that we really need. That inflation's under control. And the other thing about these charts is they're almost never right. Like if you look at the predictions for where the Fed is going to go, even with Fed guidance, relative to actually what happens, we find that it's remarkably wrong. And I my favorite is when. You, when you see a chart of the Federal Reserve chairs of all the different Fed banks and their own predictions are almost, they almost always wind up in the opposite direction. The economy is just too dynamic to look one year out. I think we can have a lot of certainty around March, what's going to happen. We can look at the bond market. It will tell us what's going to happen with a relatively good degree of certainty. But once you start getting three, four quarters out, there's just too much going on in the world for it to truly be predictive. I'm curious your thoughts around it. I know you've done so many charts on this over the years. Yeah, this this is 100% right. Both the projections of the market, which are definitely better than the Fed, but not by much. But the Fed really has the worst track record in terms of predicting what they're actually going to do a year from now and two years from now. A good point on on that is that in 2020, they said they were going to hold rates at zero for a few years, right? And here we are above 5%. So they missed the biggest wave of inflation since the early 1980s, totally missed it. And even at the end, when it was staring them in, in the face, essentially, in the middle of 2021, they were still saying, we're not going to raise interest rates, which was kind of remarkable. So yeah, take it all with a grain of salt. And my view yeah, this, the odds seem a little bit above 50-50 for March. So who cares if it's March or, or May or June? That that really doesn't var matter very much. But the, uh, the bigger question to me is, is it is it too early? Did, are they saying they won the fight uh, against inflation 
before they actually won the fight against the inflation. So what happened to the Jerome Powell's now Volcker and we're going to, you know, fight it until we get there? You know, the, the rhetoric seemed to change to me listening to him in, in December where he's like, we don't have to wait all the way until we get down to 2%. We're moving in the right direction. It's good enough. We can start, you know, cutting rates ahead of that. So I think you're right in terms of the interpretation here. I guess the bullish interpretation would be this is a soft landing, right? We're back to the Goldilocks, low inflation environment until the Fed has room to move lower. The negative interpretation is, well, they're seeing economic weakness and yeah. they're, they're starting to see the impact of those rate hikes start to hit the economy and they want to cut rates to get ahead of that. And what I would say is they shouldn't be cutting this early. And the reason they shouldn't be cutting this early is we still have this big gap here between their supposed 2% target and where inflation actually went since the beginning of 2020. So what I'm showing you here is since the beginning of 2020, where CPI would be today if we had 2% inflation versus the actual inflation, and the actual inflation is 10% above. So if the Fed is really concerned about bringing prices back to normalizing prices, shouldn't they have a period of inflation below 2% for a while to bring this back in line with that longer term target. And if that sounds crazy, just look at the Fed's own words in August 2020. This was a, a really at the time was a fascinating thing to see. Because again, they had just increased the money supply by a massive amount, did this a massive amount of quantitative easing, the federal government's borrowing trillions and trillions of dollars. And they put out this statement, Jerome Powell had this big speech, that they want to push up inflation. And they're mindful of the harmful effects that it's going to hit families, food, gasoline, shelter. But the risk of low inflation to them was so great that they were willing to push their target above 2% essentially for a period of time to get the overall long-term average at 2%. So, <laughs> and as we know what happened you know, that wasn't the work that shouldn't have been their worry at all. It should have been the opposite. But to me, shouldn't they be applying that same logic here in fighting inflation saying we'll have a rate below 2% of a period of time to bring prices back down. And I just showing a chart here of used cars. We've made some pretty good progress. We're at 31 month low. We're finally starting to see that, that crazy spike we saw in used prices go up. Part of that is because of interest rates, right? We know most people finance the cost of a car. It's going to be harder to borrow money there. So the demand is down and prices are finally starting to come down very rapidly, but they're still well above where they were. So if the Fed wants to bring down prices and help the lowest segment of the economy, as they often talk about, to me, they would leave interest rates higher to bring this down. Same thing here, Peter, with food prices, right? We had that ridiculous spike higher. Mm -hmm. Now it's down to 1%. That's great to see. I love to see that. But I wouldn't mind seeing this. And I don't think most people would mind seeing this go negative for a little right. while to bring prices back down. So I said a lot there. Does any of that <laughs> make sense to you? I'm in the higher for a longer camp. I'm not sure if they're going to do that because there's a lot of pressure on them, obviously, to ease policy with the national debt where it is and everything else. And uh, so I think they're going to cut rates, but how much? I have no idea. Yeah, I think they're looking for a reason to cut rates. They can't do it in March, but I do think they they want to cut them. You've got the national debt, you have an election year, and I think they're worried about overdoing it with uh, you know a lot of these uh, loans get going variable soon. You know, office and everything else. So there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. for them to avoid that. You know, if they're eighty percent of where they want to be and they've avoided catastrophe. <laughs> Uh, I think they want to lock that in. And you know, if they're wrong, they can always turn around and raise rates again. So I think I agree with you. We're going to see the bias to lower rates. I don't think it's going to happen in, in you know really soon, but uh, or it'll be very incremental if we do. But there the bias is there for all the reasons we've been talking about. Yeah, so this is no Volcker. This is the, the they don't want to come out and say it, but they just like they wanted in August 2020 inflation they still want inflation yeah. today right. they'd rather have higher inflation it seems than running the risk of what would happen if they didn't start cutting rates and the economy's weakening so the bias is always to easing i guess the only question is how much and maybe the market's gotten a little ahead of itself and been expecting six cuts this year we'll have to see 
obviously if the inflation data stays above what people are expecting let's say it starts moving back up back to four percent i think very quickly they're going to be forced to stop cutting rates. yeah we could but, see a quarter point drop in march and have a reversal really quick if thing if the, mar- if the economy doesn't cooperate right so all right we'll see just it's fascinating to see them flip there and no one no one i, I don't think is going to call them out on that because right. <laughs> it's uh that's you're not allowed to question the fed at those those meetings one day they're going to let me in there i'm going to sneak in there and ask them my <laughs> with questions, your charts but, and an easel yeah, and right <laughs> <laughs> jerome i have a 10-part question here <laughs> this is going to take a while <laughs> you'll see security dragging me out of there all right Let's talk about something uh, that I always find uh, interesting and a little bit funny. Uh, every couple of months, Costco. Are you a Costco guy? I yeah. am a Costco guy. Yeah. Okay. S- same here. Uh, a lot of people are, are, are more and more people are loving Costco. It's opening up all around the country, obviously doing very well uh, as a company. But the funny thing is every couple of months they put out on their website, gold bars that you can buy and essentially buying an ounce of gold and um the funny thing is they don't tie it actually to the spot price so sometimes it's above sometimes it's below you'll get a deal most recently it was a little bit above but it it sells out almost immediately and from a psychological standpoint this is always fascinating to me they sold 100 million in you know one quarter but they it seems like i i think i heard one of the executives there said they could almost you know, do 10x that and they would sell that. And it's, and you know, what's the, and you we often hear this on commercials, right? It's a bit, you know, buy gold coins, buy this, buy that. What is the underlying reason most people are buying these physical gold bars? Because we know very easily you can buy a gold ETF and not have to deal with storing and everything else. What's the number one reason, you know, Peter, or people are buying these things? It's because things are going to get bad. The apocalypse is, is coming and you're going to want to have some gold bars. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think what Costco does for this is it legitimizes it too. So I think a lot of people have this sense of, hey, you know, if they, even people, you know, very moderate people just go, hey, things could go sideways and I can use gold as a currency. It's no different than having spare water and so on in my basement. And I'm going to have some gold that I could use as currency if things, you know, really went nuts or if the, or let's say there was a cyber attack and bank accounts were frozen and things mm-hmm. like that. And, but they don't know how to buy it uh, or they don't know how to buy it in a physical way or they feel like if they go online and buy it, they're, they're going to you know get screwed over somehow. And Costco seems legit because it is legit. So I think yeah. it, it makes it accessible and it brings a legitimacy to it. You couple that with the general feeling a lot of Americans have today and it's easy to see why they sell this out. I mean, Costco could probably really move the price of gold if they had this uh, all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So here's a fun thought experiment, though. And I went down a little bit of a rab- rabbit hole on Reddit. I don't, I don't recommend this. <laughs> so this is a big, obviously, topic of conversation, as you might imagine. What type of gold bars are gold bars going to help you? But if you really go down, it depends how bad that ap- post-apocalyptic scenario is. And if it's real bad, and this kind of makes sense, gold isn't going to help you very much because either a someone's going to take your gold or b no one wants your gold because in that kind of world the only currency is food water and ammunition so what i settled out after do- doing probably too much research is ultimately it's not even guns that are the best currency it's the ammunition for those guns in in that worst case scenario that is the ultimate currency more than gold because you need the security for someone's going to steal your gold, someone's going to steal your food, someone's going to steal your water. So more rational would be to stock up on those kinds of things, which got me thinking back to COVID there, the kind of crazy thing, if you went to Costco during that time, people were filling up carts, not of food or canned food, which I would have guessed something like that or water, but toilet paper. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) it was kind of... People are not very rational when it comes to thinking about worst case scenarios. <laughs> I don't know. I, I might rather die of thirst than not have toilet paper, Charlie. So I'm not sure how <laughs> rational they were. But this story <laughs> reminds me of uh, I was in a uh, a kitchen of uh, two people that were prospective clients. Um, and we with somebody else at Creative, and we're sitting in the kitchen and 
they're very, very like, what if the world goes sideways oriented? And we were talking about different things and different solutions. And I asked, well, do you have like a whole bunch of stuff? And because you're so think this might happen. He goes, yeah, I've got all of that over there. It's this huge safe. And I go, that's a huge safe. What all do you have in there? And, and he goes, guns. And I go, what else? And he goes, nothing. He goes, that's all I need to protect myself and get whatever it is I need whenever I need it. And I just thought, wow, that's a really, that really is, um, you know, it kind of doesn't matter what you have in your basement. If it's really, yeah. really bad, um, you know, you're going to be, it, it can, it's, it's, there's a, a slippery slope to crisis to disaster. Uh, and there's a very tiny window in there where going shopping with your gold is going to work. Yeah. And I just think like practically speaking, I, this is not none of the people, pe this is not a rational thing, right? But if things got so bad that your gold ETF was compromised and the financial system is shut down, I very much doubt that people are going to be accepting that gold bar. That's going to get you very far. Right? <laughs> so maybe stocking up in food and water for you know, a period of time makes some sense. But to me, the gold bar thing doesn't make any sense uh, whatsoever. And at certain points, it's going to become a problem for you to, what do I do with this, right? Uh, depending on how much you uh, of, of these gold bars you have. But what I thought was really kind of fascinating for these people buying, going online at Costco and buying gold bars, what would have happened instead of buying gold bars had they Instead, <laughs> just bought Costco stock. <laughs> so Costco goes public in December 1985. It's been one of the best performing companies in the market since then. 116,000% return, which you can't really process that. Gold has outpaced inflation, but not by as much as people might think. 413%. CPI is up 228%. And just to put some math to that, what would have ten thousand dollars grown to had you put it in Costco stock, December '85, over eleven million gold, ten thousand grows to fifty-six thousand. So, if there isn't that apocalypse, uh, most likely the stock market, as we know, is going to over long periods of time outperform, and the best performing stocks within that such as Costco are going to outperform just by the yeah. unbelievable amounts. <laughs> yeah. Just stocks, an ironic thing. Stocks over gold for sure. And this, you know, this period of time you're showing for gold is actually a period of outperformance for gold. Normally gold tracks inflation and that's it. You know, over the very long run, whether you look at a hundred years or a thousand years, gold tracks inflation. And so it, the, the fact that it's even beat inflation by a little bit over this time period is, is remarkable. Yeah, last last hundred years, gold a little bit above inflation. Investment grade bonds better than gold. Stocks much better than both of those. So, and what people don't take into account, I think, with gold, is the high volatility that it has and the long periods you can go where gold does essentially nothing. So, from right. 1980 to 2000, 20 year period, gold was cut in half. So, a lot of people yeah. got, bought gold bars were very popular. In 1979, 1980, when gold had that enormous run up and people for 20 years later had half of their value while the stock market, you know, went bananas during that 20 period, uh, 20 period period of time. But uh, I don't think this is going to change anyone's mind <laughs> if you're right. If, you're, if the people that are buying gold uh, on Costco are going to continue to buy it uh, and uh, you can't change that. But if, if you're thinking about it. Just run run down that rabbit hole a little bit, I would suggest. The gold bar probably isn't going to be, and hopefully we'll never have to come anywhere close to finding out if a gold bar is worth anything in that scenario. All right, so let's move on to markets here. This is something I've coined uh, about five years ago. I call it the freedom premium, Peter. And we don't often talk about markets in terms of level of freedom or honesty, and le levels of corruption. But it turns out it's actually pretty important. There's been a lot of different research. I've wrote my own analysis on this. And I think the best example of this divide today would be between the US and China. And this is something probably might shock people uh, if they haven't looked at, at this. But US technology stocks over the last 10 years up 6x, up a 509%. China technology stocks actually down 10%. So think about stocks that were hugely, hugely popular 10 years ago, 
you probably remember the Alibaba IPO and Jack Ma at the exchange and all of the euphoria around that, Tencent, many other, Baidu, many, many companies over the years. And these things were trading at enormous multiples. Back then, there was a lot of hope, a lot of promise. None of that today has materialized. There's a lot of different reasons for that. There's a lot of fear around this today. And if we look at, this is not just technology. If we look at broader China, large cap stocks down 23% over the last decade, S&P 500 has tripled. So huge divide. And I wouldn't say this is unexpected, but if, you, if it was 10 years ago and you said that, very much unexpected because people were just talking about China growth technology, 1.4 billion people, you have to be invested in that market. The opinion is totally changed today. Before I give you my view on the situation, what's your take on China, the, the concept that freedom matters? Because for a long time, people were saying, well, China has liberalized, there's a little bit of freedom, that's okay, it doesn't matter that they're still doing all of this censorship and there's a lack of freedom in so many ways in that country. They've done enough at where you can you can invest in their markets and be safe. So, so before I give you my diatribe, <laughs> what's your take on U.S. versus China and the idea that freedom matters in the long run? Well, I think it's twofold. I think one, um, independent of the freedom, there were a lot of questions around the accounting of these Chinese companies. And like I remember, Bogle would not uh, in, invest in China because he just said he didn't trust it. And it turned out he was very right. I mean, there's a a movie, I can't remember the name of it, going through just all the fraud that China was conducting in their small cap market. Um, if you look at um, the, the lack of freedom, I mean, we we're talking about Alibaba. I think Jack Ma went missing for like several months. I mean, it, I mean China yeah. literally kidnapped him, indoctrinated him and put him back. Out. I mean, it was, it's absolutely insane uh, what is ha what, what's happening in China. So there's a huge amount of distrust around the manipulation of the market and the fraud around the market. And I think that, that there was a big awakening around that about seven or eight years ago that really changed people's attitudes. I think second, second is a lot of this discrepancy isn't even attributable to that. It's attributable to the fact that American companies have just won at least over the last decade. So if you look at what we're comparing tech to tech, I mean, obviously our tech has Apple and Microsoft and Google, but these are not just, not just wound up dominate, becoming trillion and multi-trillion dollar companies in their space because of their recurring revenue and expanding market share. But now they're getting a whole other wave with AI. So we just happen to have, uh, for a lot of reasons, the top talent with top AI and top technology and everything being equal, they would have outperformed anyway, even if both uh, countries were free. And of course, when we compare large cap to large cap, both are skewed by big tech. And so that's a factor. So you have a huge amount of warranted distrust and market manipulation coupled with outperformance of U.S. big tech. And I think those two things drive a lot of it. Yeah, no doubt. You, you said a lot there. I agree 100% with everything you said. And, and I think the biggest part is what you talked about in terms of trusting the accounting and trusting that as a shareholder, you're actually going to receive that portion of the profits that you were promised. And I think that's the big question ultimately, because we've seen time and again, the CCP say, you've gotten too big. You have right. to either too powerful as an individual, Jack Ma, and there's been many examples. In addition to him, you're talking too much. You're making too much money. We don't like you doing this area here. So you got to stop doing that. And ultimately, what I always say is, can we really trust any of the data coming out of China? Because they're saying constantly, Peter, we hear they've been growing at 7% real GDP. And now it's a slowdown and they're still growing at 5% GDP. But yet their population is declining. Their housing market is in a deep recession. They have unemployment rate, youth unemployment rate skyrocketing. But yet their GDP is still more than double ours. That doesn't make very much sense to me. And if it is actually the case that their GDP data is correct, I don't believe it, but that hasn't filtered down to the profits of the company. So you compound a 7% real GDP, even looking at, at a, a country like India, you could see the difference because the profits in their public companies and India's companies are trading at, at you know, a lot of them a very high valuation. But 
it's more in line with the U.S. in terms of, okay, this is their revenue, this is their profit margin. In China, you don't see that. Like, where was the growth in profits that should have come with this enormous period of growth in GDP? So what I say is be skeptical about anything that's coming out, right, of that country. Yeah, I, they face an existential threat. Our, our C, uh, CIO, Jamie Batmer, shared with me, he's like, oh, I think, you know, China's population is going to drop from one point whatever billion to 500 million over the next few decades. And I'm like, I just cannot believe that. And he sent me the articles on it. You know, they had that one child policy. You could only have one child. And now they're trying to get everybody because they have a big problem now demographically. Now yeah. they're trying to get people to have more than one child and they won't do it. And you're looking at their population getting cut in half, which would obviously result in complete economic collapse. So it's going to be interesting to see how they how they navigate that. You were talking about something, Charlie, that reminded me of a story I read You were about how that whenever a business does really well, they go, oh, you're getting too big and they kind of cut them down to size. That's an understatement. If, if someone's got five minutes and they just want their mind blown, you can just Google Chinese uh, billionaire deaths. It's insane. Like if, if someone becomes a billionaire in China, they basically die. Uh, they've, they And the way they die is, is almost, it's it's like out of a movie. Somebody falls off a, cl a boulder and someone falls out of his window and it's all he uh, falls down. His st this story after story after story about people uh, who are like 40 accidentally uh, dying in China once they become a little too big. And so it's a really interesting, I mean, you it, a lot of going on in that market and, a, and and it's very negative across the board. Yeah. And then, so as an investor, right, we're, uh, we're observing this in real time. And, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, I would have said this, I wouldn't have predicted it would be this big of a gap. But what was crazy to me for a long time, Peter, uh, is, and I'll skip over this chart and come back to it. What, what was crazy to me is that the valuation levels in 2007, 2008, in China, because of just that euphoria and sentiment, were way higher than the U.S. And that, like for a number of reasons, didn't make sense to me. And and for all the what we're talking about, but today, it's much more difficult like, as an investor to say, okay, what's going to happen? Because the U.S. looking at the CAPE ratio, thirty-two, China is at ten and a half. Now, ten and a half might be too high. I, I don't know, but the point is that a lot, everything that we're talking about, the markets not immune immune to it they're reflecting it and so perhaps and hopefully this is what i always say hopefully for the people of china they will ch reverse course and change their policies and really increase freedom try to reduce corruption become more shareholder friendly allow people to be successful without making them <laughs> disappear and if any of those things were to happen that would be a positive upside surprise, obviously, and I think people, the markets would respond to it. Now, we, yeah, and I, I think can't strong China is good, that. The strong China is good for America. I mean, we obviously yeah. we want to perform better and be the world leader, but we want there to be a strong China to, and, and have a strong global economic system. And so, it, you know, no one's rooting, uh, rooting against them, that's for sure. Absolutely. So hopefully this rebounds uh, and... Just a final point here. It's not just China. The Morningstar did an interesting study looking at countries based on corruption rankings. And what they found is the higher the corruption ranking in uh, this company that does this every year, uh, the lower the stock market performance. And this is just looking back 10 years, but they actually looked back over a 30 year period and found very high correlation between those two variables. So Denmark being the least corrupt country, had one of the best performance, United States, obviously, on the better end, and so on and so forth. So not just a Chinese, Chinese story here. The level of corruption within, you know, we're talking about bribery, any, any number of things, which filters in to the corporate world, obviously, the higher the level of corruption, the lower the stock market performance. So honesty is the best policy when it comes to investing in countries. And this is, you would think that the markets would have figured this out. And then there, that premium would go away, but it seems to have persisted over the last thirty years. Uh, does that surprise you at all? Not, not even a little bit. It's it, you have to. It's, it's, a, it's take for example. I think what a lot of people could relate to is there's a lot of countries people won't buy a second home in because the the governments have a history of taking over the the property, or there's a, a lack of trust that you'll own that property later. It's the same thing with the market. Just like you said, 
when you buy something, you have to be able to count on it in the future. And if you can't, you're not going to do business there. And so it makes perfect sense. Yeah. When you said the property thing, what came to mind, obviously, is is many of those Chinese billionaires, multimillionaires, what are they doing with their money as fast as they can? They're buying real estate in the US, Canada, outside of China. And they're almost, you know, from the stories you read, price insensitive. <laughs> so they want to just get that money out of there because they pretty much know at some point it's probably going to be taken from them and probably by force anyway. So right. that has had a, a big impact, obviously, on global real estate markets. But that's a whole nother story. We won't get into that today. So that's why the freedom. Uh, premium exists. We're going to end with signal or noise here, Peter. Touched on it a little bit last year, but I felt the need to bring it up again here because I'm seeing a number of articles like this with headlines like this, presidential election years are bad for stocks. And uh, the this was an interesting one. This was a poll by Investopedia done at the end of last year, basically asking, what are you most concerned about in 2024? Number one was the 2024 elections. Over 60% of people said they were concerned that was going to impact the performance of your their investments over the next 12 months, and probably because they're seeing headlines like this. And there's there plenty to choose from. That kind of shocked me because I know the data, you you know the data, but yet they people are still saying it. Uh, before I show you the actual data here, I, I know I know we've you've talked about it. Any partic t particular reason why an investor should say, and this is what you're hearing, Pierre, we hear this every four years, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. This time is different. You sh now you should be very afraid if Trump wins, if Biden wins, it seems like those are going to be the two nominees. What do you say to investors? You you've had to talk them down every, every four years in 2020 and, and before that and before that in the last few it was, that was a very smart move to talk them down. How are you going to talk them down this year in the most important election of our lifetime? <laughs> yeah, there's one of the one of the few things that, in terms of proportion of getting worked up versus actual impact on the market, this might be the biggest thing. Like it causes the most stress, a presidential election, and actually has the least impact on what the stock market is going to do. And I think it's just because it is it is the news cycle narrative is eighty percent around the presidential politics and the rest is wars, right? And so it's just so much. Uh, it's like a soap opera. And so you can really get you know, pulled, into, pulled into it. But then you start to overestimate the importance. I think it's very important when it comes to, for example, uh, nominating Supreme Court justices. But gun control, abortion rights, things like that, they don't impact the economy, or certainly not in a substantive way, right? And so it is a big, big deal when it comes to certain things, but not when it comes to the stock market earnings and the economy. I'm not saying a president can't do something super dramatic, but we have not seen that in my entire lifetime where a president has ever done anything that's been significant enough to really be meaningful uh, to the markets. And so I, it's the most most hype compared to outcome of of anything that gets people stressed out. Yeah, absolutely. And we just talked about China. And there, I would say, if there was a leadership change there, that could have a meaningful impact because that one individual has so much power, right? It's all yeah. concentrated and they could do for good or for bad, right? Yeah. Uh, but thankfully, in America, we have a system where that one individual doesn't have the ultimate power over the economy. Thankfully, there's term limit. In, in terms of how long they could be in there, we could we could remove them from office if they're they're being uh, they're committing crimes, any number of, of checks and balances. And the U.S. economy is so dynamic that thank goodness it doesn't rely on this one individual for good or for bad. And so I would say the promises they make, and you're going to hear them, over, you know, this year all the time. We're going to bump up real GDP to five, six, seven percent. You're going to hear all kind of outlandish. If that were actually true, yeah, that could have a meaningful impact, mm -hmm. but we know it doesn't. And thankfully, it doesn't. I think uh, in, in my view, obviously, the more they stay out of things, the better, actually. And and, and that's why we tend to see a split government actually <laughs> be somewhat better for the markets. But here's the actual data here. 
beater in terms of annualized returns for the S and P 500. Election years, 10 percent. Non-election years, 9.7 percent. Almost no difference if we look at percentage of positive returns. 83 percent of presidential election years are positive. 69 percent for non-presidential election years. So slightly better even. So I don't know what data that article <laughs> headline <laughs> is talking about. There's no there's no uh, data driven reason for you to make a change in your portfolio. That's all you can say. It doesn't mean the markets could definitely be down this year. We're definitely not saying that. Certainly not. But to attribute that to the election uh, in a rational basis, not very mm-hmm. rational. And Vanguard went back even further. Uh, they went back to 1860, looking at a 60 40 portfolio. What did they find? Presidential election years, 8.7%. Annualized non presidential election years, 7.7%. So there you have it. That's the data. It's probably not going to prevent people from getting a lot of anxiety, but don't stress yourself out. Who the president is isn't going to probably change your day to day life as much as you think it will. We're going to hear people saying they're going to leave the country no matter who wins. This is still the best country to live in. In, in my view, it doesn't matter who the president is. And in four years, if they're so bad, there'll be a new president. So We'll end it right there, Peter. A lot of interesting topics today. As always, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We're also available on Apple, Google, Spotify, all the podcast platforms. And if you're an investor, individual, business owner, and you're thinking about 2024, you're trying to make a plan, reach out to us at Creative Planning, over 200 billion in assets under management and advisement. I'll have a link in the show notes. Click on that to set up a call or a meeting. We're in all 50 states and we're here to help. So thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you next time on Signal or Noise. Noise.